starting a new series uh, today called Making Kingdom Choices, Making Kingdom Choices. And we're going to talk about that in regard to family time and money the next three weeks. But, but in order to even be able to, to talk about that, we have to get our mind around what it means to have a kingdom mindset anyway. And that's what I want to talk about this morning is having a, a kingdom mindset. So uh, let me ask you a question. It's really important related really, to having a kingdom mindset. How many of you like cats? C-A-T, cats, all right. So this story's gonna offend you. Um, I just want you to know, I'm just pre- prepping you ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> I do not like cats um, because they make me sneeze and cause me asthma, right? So anybody else in that boat, like if I come to your house and you have a cat, I got 10 minutes, then I'm gonna die. I need an EpiPen and something. So uh, with that in mind, I'll tell you the story. So, <clears throat> so a couple weekends ago, Easter weekend, we had between two Good Friday services and four uh, Easter Sunday services, we had a party at my house on Saturday. And it was like 40 people, all of our family. Um, cr- it was, it's always crazy, but it's always fun. And, uh, and so we have this Easter egg hunt at the end of grilling out and all this stuff. And traditionally, the the fam, the parents have hidden eggs. And so my kids are like clocking out of this Easter egg thing now, you know. Um, so the older ones are helping. I got one 11-year-old who will still in a cool way ha- uh, hunt Easter eggs. Uh, if you have an 11-year-old, you know what the, that, that means. And then, but then we have all these like first and second cousins now who are this tall, who really want to hide and hunt. And so we're hiding these things. And, and Angela's cousin, who's our age, uh, sort of back, she's, she's between my house and the bushes. There's a French drain in the backyard and she was hiding an egg back there. And she backs out and she starts saying, there's a cat dying in your French drain. I was like, I was confused. For instance, I don't have a cat. Why is there a cat in my back in my backyard? Especially, I might could understand a cat in the front yard, but how did this cat that's dying get in the backyard and decide to die in my French drain? And so, and there are forty people there, and we're getting ready to hunt Easter eggs. So, you know, your three-year-olds, your five-year-olds, you don't want them to see cat on life support last moments, because this was last moments. I mean, I, I was, it was the, it, was, it ended there uh, in the drain. I know, oh, but I didn't feel that way <laughs> at all. <clears throat> but here's the drama. Here's what went down. And so she, I go over there and check it out. And I'm like, she's not lying. There's a cat dying in my drain. It's obviously, uh, obviously dying. So we all have choices to make in life. And I have to tell you this part so you'll understand the next part. So when I was in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, my wrestling coach uh, employed me. He had a farm, and he employed me to, he, he, was, he trapped on the side. So he trapped mink and muscat, muskrat and skin them and then sell them. I, I know some of you have mink coats, though. Some of you, one, maybe two, I don't know. Maybe you don't admit it, but you got that thing you put, it's really cold, you know. Um, <laughs> Well, it starts with me. That's where it starts because you have to go to the trap and when you get to the trap, mink or muskrat will chew their leg off and get out of the trap so you have to club them. I know, welcome to church. <laughs> and, so, <clears throat> and so I've got a lot of clubbed animals under my belt, like three years of poof, put it in the bag, poof, put it in the bag. I'm good at it. <clears throat> and, so, and so this cat to me... In my French drain, I could tell he was a goner. She, he, I'm not sure which. And uh, I thought, well, if I were here alone, I would club this thing and it would be over. Because, listen, because <laughs> it's grace to put an animal down that's dying, it's in pain, right? It's grace. And I'm not going to pay for that, see? I'm not going to pay to do that. And so <clears throat> that's Growing up in Tennessee, that's where you get it. Somebody put that in you. So, um, so, but I have this problem, and the problem is, and the problem is, somebody called 911 on me. That's the problem. 
So the problem is, uh, the problem is that uh, I have all these other people around, right? And so little kids, and then there's two key players in the story. One is another cousin who's an adult who the advice that she's given me in that moment is simply take this cat to an emergency vet. And I am like, no, no way am I spending one dollar on this cat. Doesn't even have a collar. This cat. I don't know where this cat's from. So I go talk to my next door neighbor. He's out in the driveway. He's like, nope, that's not our cat. Talk to all the neighbors. Nope, it's not the cat. To me, we're working closer to the club. Now nobody knows this cat. It's not going to be missed, at least in my general vicinity. And so uh, I go in the back. And now, but now another neighbor has come over who has many cats. I don't know how many cats she has. Many. She loves cats. She loves every living thing, and God bless her. I, I do too, to a point. And so this cat, so she's over, and she's like, give me a towel, get me water. She's giving me instructions, and I'm like, it's dead. Look at its pupils, like big, open mouth. This is over. Let me just do the funeral right here. We'll be done. <laughs> Bury it in your backyard. Um, and so really, really the cat like dies in the thing, but she doesn't believe it's dead. So she wants me to treat this cat now as living and to pick it up. And I'm like, I'm going to sneeze. I don't want to, I don't want to pick it up. So I get this towel and, uh, <clears throat> oh, I thought to myself it, before, right before it passed this cat, I thought to myself, the only choice I can make here that's good for me and everybody else, the reputation of Pastor Brian, the cat, all the neighbors, is to call animal control, right? Because that's what they're going to do. They're going to put this cat out in a humane, humane way if it doesn't die first. And so I call animal control. In my neighborhood, that guy's name is Troy. And so Troy is off because it's Easter weekend, right? I mean, why? So I'm like, one more step closer to the club. And, um, and so I'm going to clear the backyard. The Lord certainly, I'm going to make up a story about how this cat died and we're going to be out of here. And so, uh, but they send the cops to my house because Troy's not there. So the police come and I know them in my neighborhood and I'm like, oh, guys, I'm sorry. There's, I didn't, I don't want to call the police for this, you know. It's, they're like, no, we come out for anything, whatever. We go to the back, and uh, he goes, yep, that cat is dying. I was like, you're right. I, I, you're right. And, uh, and so, it, long story short, Angela somehow gets everybody sort of in the house, and I'm telling the policeman, like, okay, hurry. I'll get the towel. We get to, over to him, and it's, the cat is gone. We put him in the car. I mean, died, just died in the, in the French train. Put him in the, the car. Car speeds off. Everybody comes out. I'm like, cat went to heaven. I don't know where it is, <clears throat> that kind of thing. I don't know where the cat goes after it goes in the police car, all right? So this is Easter, before four services. And uh, so people are crying, people are snickering in the side, like the, the non-cat lovers in the family. Uh, my father-in-law knows nothing about it. The police show up and he's like, what, what? He's a Lebanese guy, you know? And they're like, we're here about your cat. And he's like, no, we got no cats, <laughs> nothing. So it's just, it's just crazy. But in that moment, I was like, I have this choice to make. I can either call animal control, I can club this cat, or I can just, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's, it's, it's tough. Now, here's the thing. We all have choices to make, all of us. And it's not just about s somewhat silly things like that. And by the way, if you're going to send an email to me about that cat, send it to Josh Allen at... <laughs> Church. It'll be read immediately. Um, so if you don't know who that is, he catches all of our email, and so he'll filter it for you. Um, 
we all have these choices to make, and it's not just simple little choices, but it can be, but it also could be really big choices about how we roll in family life and with our time, with our money, with our, just our own life and, and all, all of that kind of thing. And, uh, and there's about four things. We make these choices based on our mindset. Okay, so my mindset in that situation was cats make me sneeze. This cat deserves to pay. And I know how because of seventh and eighth and ninth grade. I'm a really good at clubbing animals. And so I can do this fast. Once it's over, it's grace. That's my mindset. It's not yours. That's okay. But that was my mindset in the moment. Every one of you walked in here with a mindset. All of you have a mindset. You, you, right now, you have a mindset about that cat. You think, I hate Pastor Brian now. Or you think, I love Pastor Brian more than I ever loved him before. <laughs> it's one of the two. You just have a mindset, right? Everybody comes to life with, with, with the mindset, and the mindset is formed in the, these, these four ways. And this is really important. Everybody has to answer these questions. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, secular, whatever. You, you're going to answer these four questions. It's going to shape your mindset. The first question is, who am I? Who am I? It's an identity question. The second question is, who is the king? Now, the world might not necessarily say it that way, but everybody has to decide at some point uh, what dictates everything. Who's in charge here? And so for some, it might be King Jesus, like, like some of you. It might, it might be a philosophy for other, or science for, for another person, or a god, a particular god, or religion, or whatever. But, but you have to answer the question, who is king? So who am I? Who is king? Third question, what are my values? Okay, so what, what are the things in life that shape my behavior? What do I value? And then the fourth question that we all have to answer is, where is my hope? Where am I putting my hope for today, for tomorrow, for the future? Everybody has to answer those, those questions, those four Whether they, However they answer them, they have to answer them. And that was the same thing that was going on in the Church of Colossae. So we're, we are the 21st century American church, particularly related to, to the south side of Houston and Galveston County. This letter is written to a first or second century church of Colossae, growing in, in the face of Rome and, and the shadow of a temple of, of Zeus and all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, it's really not that different than the 21st century American predicament when it comes to the tension between the culture's mindset and the mindset of Christ. They're very, two very different things. So would you stand with me? I told that cat story before we read the scripture as not to defile the scripture. Would you stand with me? We will read Revelation, I mean, Colossians chapter 3. Man, in the end is in, in my head. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Could be seated. So this church is being taught by the Apostle Paul how to have a kingdom mindset in the face of a cultural mindset that is very different. It's the same issues that we we face uh, today. And Paul really frames these first four verses around those questions we just mentioned. Who am I? Who is king? What are my values? Where is my hope? And the very first thing that he does is give identity clarity, but he doesn't assume anything about the listener. He starts with a word, if. So he says, if, if then you have been raised with Christ. So to the listener, to the hearer of the letter, to the reader of the letter, if then you have been raised with Christ. So everything he's getting ready to say hinges on the mindset that begins with your identity as raised with Christ. He would go on to say in verse three, uh, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So here's the identity issue for the believer. My mindset, has to be determined in my identity. And my identity is that I died to myself and I have been raised 
to walk in new life with Jesus. That, that's paramount. It's core. It's, it's the very essence of who we are. Remember, when we baptize people right here, uh, we say, this, have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? They say, I do. And then we say, we bury you with ba- in baptism and we, you're raised to walk in new life. It's a picture of this idea that Paul is hitting on right here that our identity changes when we come to Christ. Like before Christ, I'm just living for me. Who else do I have to live for? But in Christ, I die to myself. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. I die to myself. And then as Jesus died on a cross, he was put in a tomb. He was raised to new life on the third day. Even so, our life in Christ, when we come to him in confession, uh, admitting that he is Lord of all things, that he is the king, uh, and, and we place our belief in him for the forgiveness of sins, then we are raised to new life. Meaning, yes, this body, this flesh of mine is gonna die, but my soul will never miss a beat like I'm already living a new life now. And someday, some of you may come to my, the funeral where my body is laid out here and, and, and the, the flesh is over, but my soul will be with him for eternity. And he's got a whole plan for eternity that's way bigger than my years that I get here, right? So I'm raised to walk in this new life. And it means we think differently. We have to. The old, we don't think the old way, we think the new way. Now, Paul goes on to say that this, this identity of yours, for you have died, verse three, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So you've been crucified with Christ. You've died to yourself. You've raised with him in new life as a believer, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, this refers to a hidden reality. It's not hidden in this room today. But when you step out of here and you go into your neighborhoods or into your workplace, to your school, wherever you go, to the world, to the culture, this is a hidden reality, this kingdom of God thing. They're not paying attention to it. Yet you say, because if then you have been raised with Christ, you would say, this is the most important reality in all of your life. Most of the world doesn't even see it, right? It's a hidden reality. And this is what Paul is referring to. It's a reality not perceived by those who have not yet understood the mystery of the gospel. It's a reality determining, determining the outworking of history and the true source of wisdom and knowledge. It's a reality focused on Christ. It's a reality that is the kingdom of God. It is a reality that drives our everyday-ish life. It's a reality that is lived in a world who makes worldly choices based on a worldly mindset driven by faith in the Son of God and the expansion of the kingdom causing us to think uh, differently. Sometimes the world is going to say that this kind of mindset is foolish or folly because it's hidden to them. And here you see it. When we're in here, we talk about it. We see it, but sometimes we lose sight of the fact that our life, <clears throat> we've died and our life is hidden with Christ and God, that this is who we are, this is our identity. Now, the second thing Paul points out here is the king's authority and power. It's just in verse one. This is the second sort of part of the framework to a mindset is who is king? And he says in, in verse one again, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And he tells us that on purpose because he wants us to know not only is our identity in Christ having been raised to walk in new life, but we seek the things of Christ because he is seated at the right hand of God, the Father. Now, the right hand in all of the biblical text is the place of prominence and power. Prominence and power. What Paul is saying is he didn't just rise from the dead. He ascended to the heaven and he has the place of prominence. He's instructing the ever-expanding kingdom of God and he has all authority to do it. This is who 
The king is Jesus himself. Psalm 110 would allude to this positional authority. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So I'll just call you back to the garden right after sin takes place. Part of the curse is to the serpent that you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. There is from the beginning an understanding between God and the enemy that there will be a crushing by one who has authority, that he will crush your head. The psalmist says here that that our, his enemies, the enemies of Jesus will be like a footstool, that he will take his place. He will sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, this little psalm verse is quoted in Mark 12, 36, Acts 2, 34 and 35, Hebrews 1, 13. It is alluded to in Mark 14, 62, Romans 8, 34, 1 Corinthians 15, 25, Ephesians 1, 20, Hebrews 1, 3, 8, 1, 10, 12 to 13, and 1 Peter 3, 22. This is a position of authority that all the writers of our Bible were banking on, that they understood to be true, that not only is our identity in Christ, but that he sits at the right hand of God, that he has all authority, that he is the king of the kingdom. If you worship the king, you obey him. You take orders from the king. You, you, uh, your mindset is that not only has he rescued me and redeemed me, but now I'm gonna serve him because he's the king and I am not. And so we live his particular way. We think with his mind, with his thoughts. Uh, this is part of the, the mindset that we have to have. Now, Paul goes on to speak about our values. This is the sort of third piece of the framework that forms a mindset. Verse one and two, just repeat it to you again. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. So Paul tells us two things about our values, how we live, what we should value every day, that we have this choice between things that are above and things that are below. Uh, Always in scripture, when there, there is talk like that, things that are above are the things of God that last that last for eternity, that will always be. They're the ever-expanding kingdom of God. They cannot be destroyed. Things below are things of the earth, the things that Jesus said, moth, moth and rust destroy. Instead, build up for yourselves treasures in heaven, he said. So we have this constant tension in life where we're, we're constantly thinking about where are we putting our focus, things on On the earth, things below are things uh, that are above, things that are in heaven. And and Paul says that he uses these two verbs. One is seek. Seek the things that are above. Seek means to pursue or to chase, to find it, to go after it. And, And just ask yourself this question as we sort of prime the pump for the next few weeks. What are you chasing? in life? What are you pursuing in life? What are you seeking in life? What do you spend all your energy running after in life? Uh, The second thing he says is that we have to set our minds on things that are, are above. So it's not just the pursuit of our life, but it's an intentional focus. It's an intentional mindset that we would actually intentionally think about the things that are above, that we would focus that way. It, it you know, practically involves reading the word, practically involves paying attention to what God is doing. It practically involves praying. I mean, if we wanna know uh, what the king's orders are, we're gonna have to go to him. If we need to, as, as believers, you know, to pour ourselves out to him and be filled up by him. It involves uh, not just pursuit, but a mindset. It is that kind of mindset that, that drives you to prayer, that drives you to the word, that, that, that it causes you to look at situations in life maybe differently than the world would look at them because you have a, a different mindset, 
right? So he's saying, you know, value the things that are above with the way that you live life and the way that you think more than the things that are below. And see, that's the tension. It was a tension for the Church of Colossae. It's a tension for the 21st century American church. What monopolizes your thoughts? Think about that. You ever heard of metacognition, thinking about thinking? What do you think about all the time? What monopolizes your, your thoughts? Paul is just saying simply that we should set our minds on things that are above. Our mental focus has to be that way. Things that are above the king and his kingdom leads to life at last forever. Things that are below, things of the world, death and destruction, things that don't last. <clears throat> if we thought that way, if those were our values, that we valued things that are above, so so think about this. If then we have been raised with Christ, so our identity is in Christ, and if we recognize that he sits at the right hand of the Father, that he is the king, and that we take instructions because he is the king, and we are just part of his kingdom, glad, gladly part of his kingdom, but we are nothing, nothing like him in authority or power. You, you can't hang with him in that category. He's the sovereign creator of the universe. And so if he has all authority and then, and then we're told we need to set our minds on things that are above and, and seek the things that are above more than the things that are below, how would that change the decisions that we make, the choices that we make in life? I mean, just little questions. Who we date in life? Do we get married or remain single? How hard do we fight for our marriage? What about our sexuality? What about our goals in life? How we do family, what we do with our time, what we do with our money, what we're willing to fight about versus let go. What are we compassionate about? What should we be angry about? I mean, all of those things, I mean, you could just list millions and millions of questions, but all of those things are solidified in having a kingdom mindset. And you only have that when you realize I've died to myself, I've been raised in new life, Jesus is the king seated at the right hand of the father. He's coming again. And because he's the king, he gets to give us instructions about how to live and think. And that our values have to be on the things that are above that, are above, that last, last forever, not things that, 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 that are below that don't last forever. It would change how we make decisions, how we invest, what we do, all of it. And here's the fourth piece of the framework. Paul says in verse four, uh, this, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So here's the hope piece for Christ. We talked about identity. We talked about who the king is. We talked about value. Now we're talking about hope. Where does your hope lie? Paul is saying for the believer, then clearly your hope lies right here. When Christ, who is your life, appears, meaning he's going to come back again, he's going to appear, then you will also appear with him in glory. So Paul is alluding to a longer theology that says um, Christ will return. He's not going to just stay there, but he's going to restore all things. And when it's time, when the Father says it's time, he will return and the dead in Christ shall rise and we will rule and reign with him. We will share the inheritance with him. We will, in Paul's words here, we will also appear with him in glory. That is the great hope. That's where we put our hope. So let me ask you a question. This is a hard one. Easy, but hard. Like, what do you, what do you really hope in? This is just my, like, two cents um, for what it's worth. But, you know, I've, I've just been doing ministry in Texas for 20 some odd years now. And what I think is inside these buildings, sort of this day of the week, everybody says, my hope is in Christ. But just, just can even be Sunday evening. <laughs> Life begins to happen and we lose sight of our hope or maybe we just misplace our hope or we lose our hope. We put our hope in something something else, much less worthy, 
Or, or maybe we, we would admit readily, like, my hope is right here. It's not Christ, it's right here, and I'm, I'm putting all my money, all my time, all my energy, all my thought. It's what I'm chasing. This is, this is my hope. And I just think that people know generally the right word to say, I, you know, I can't wait. I remember um, when I was, I knew Christ as a teenager. I was a disciple of Jesus, and not... Uh, perfect, not mature at all, not any, but I knew Jesus and I knew the simple thing that he's coming back. I knew that. And so I remember like days before I was able to get my driver's license, I was so excited to get my driver's license that I was praying things like, oh God, please don't send Jesus, Jesus, don't come back until I can at least drive, you know? Or it's, it's dumb, but that's how a kid thinks, right? Or I remember, I, I, I mean, Angela and I dated from the time we were 15. If you could call it dating, you couldn't even drive yet. And so it was like in the whole way at school. Um, all the way till two weeks after college graduation when we got married. And I remember like praying, Lord, like, let me graduate. This has been, this has been a long deal. I've invested a lot. And also let me get married, please. You know, let me experience that. Then you can come back. That's fine. After that, um, it's all it, 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 as good as those things are. It's nothing compared to the return of Christ and appearing with Him in glory. But I think we just do put our hopes in those things, like milestones or a, a thing, a material possession, or or the next thing, the next job, you know, whatever it is. We just place our hope. If I could just get here, then everything will be okay. Here's the secret I'm gonna let you in on. Life doesn't let up. I mean, if we could pull an 80-year-old up here and just have that 80 or 90-year-old tell their story, like when was the time in life where it got easy? Any, anybody would say that, I mean, there were good times, there were bad times, mountaintop, but it doesn't just let up, you know? So the hope is beyond this life. It doesn't matter how big your house is, how small your house is, everybody's walking in the desert. So you, you, you drink the living water of Jesus Christ now, and you appear with him in glory. And that is the great hope, a new city of Jerusalem, and a, a new city of peace, a new heaven, new earth. New, all, that is the great hope, but I think sometimes we lose sight of that. I think Paul knew that the church of Colossae maybe even struggled with that as they look at this giant temple you know, to, to Roman gods and their little church is in a house. You know, how, do you, how do you compete? Like, what do we have? Should we have our own Easter egg hunt so the people that worship Zeus will come over here and hunt eggs? Think they're thinking like that? No, they're not. Paul's teaching them to put their hope in the appearing of Christ and sharing that with him. That's the great, that's the great hope. I just think sometimes we, we here in Texas lose sight of that uh, for lots of reasons. And so I would just ask you, what, where's your hope? So our mindset is founded in those four things. Our identity, knowing who the king is, understanding our values are for things that are above, not of below. And finally, our great hope is not in retirement, is not in any sort of house, it's not in any vehicle, it's not in our kids, our grandkids. So the returning of Jesus Christ, his appearing and sharing with him in that glory. This is the mindset we must have as believers when we step into the issues. I'll just mention three over the next few, three weeks. We could do a lot, but when we step into the issues of family, time, and money, Okay, so I promise you that I hope people come back next week, not because of the cat uh, story, like you're choosing, I'm not coming, but the, the tension between the culture and family time and money and the kingdom of God and family time and money really kind of smarts. 
There's a real tension. Okay. I'm not going to ask you for anything. I'm just going to simply present to you the word of God and ask you to consider having a kingdom mindset, learning to make kingdom choices with your family time and money. Asking King Jesus what he would like for you to do with your family, your time, and your money. I'm not going to lay any law out for you. I'm not going to be legalistic about anything. I'm just going to simply show you the scriptures and get you to engage the king. You know you don't need a priest. You have one priest, the man Christ Jesus. Deal with him on it. But listen to his word. Bring your friends. There's, there's no, there's no uh, more important uh, message than s- suburbanites all along this belt, you know, from Clear Lake all the way to Friendswood, Pearland, all of that. No greater message they need to hear than have a kingdom, learning how to make kingdom choices. Between here and the island, no greater message that, that, that people need to hear. And I'm speaking primarily of believers or people who say they are believers. I would never expect somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus to make kingdom choices. I'll I'll present to them who Jesus is for sure. I'm talking about people who say, I love God. Okay, let's go there. How many of you are willing to go there with me, okay? And maybe bring somebody with you because this is so important. What if we, just we in this room, what if? we decided we're going to make kingdom choices consistently daily about our family, our time, and our money. We're going to let Jesus be the king of those things. How would it be different, right? Just by 